Having said that, we will talk of what is called business model canvas because you will work on your problems as we go through the slides. Okay, so that will be mean that you have done half the work of business model canvas and why it is important to do business model canvas, I'll explain as we go through this, okay, today's class. So when we talk of business model, you know, what do you, what comes to your mind when it, when we talk of a business model? So what does a business model mean? When someone says business model, what does it mean? What does a model mean? So when I was your age, model meant two things to me. One was those models who walked on the ramp. The other was the equation based models, which I, which most of them went over my head. I still do not understand Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, okay, <laughs> to be honest. But a model and a business model is exactly what Naman just answered. It captures the entire business picture as much as possible of your own startup or business or idea. But it should go slightly beyond that. It should show you how to make money, how to make profits. And that is a key part because when you're operating a business, you do it to make revenues, to make money and to maximize profits. Otherwise, there's no point in doing a startup and a business. Even social entrepreneurs, they have to generate money to survive. Okay, so that is a key part of your thing, of your business model. And so as much as possible, you should have on one slide, uh, you know, your entire business model, like one picture of your business model. So this picture I have here, actually, if you look closely, it shows all these gear wheels, but it starts from here, from the center, the idea. Okay, and then it goes to the product. So this gear wheel drives the product gear wheel, the product gear wheel drives the people gear wheel because all these personnel are hired and then drives that and these are by the way the customers that you will sell to and they will give you money. Okay, but at the same time you have workers who are part of this business, they are generating other forms of products like IP and other things and that is also generating you money. So this is just a representative picture but you should have a picture in your head of something like this of your business model, okay? And it should outline what is the value delivered to the customer because that's what will help you have long-term sustain sustainability. Now, why have a business model? I have list listed that already. To maximize profitability, to provide optimal value to the customer, to ensure smooth and seamless operations. Why? You understand what it means, right? Smooth and seamless operations. Let's say that team is doing windmill set up along the highways, okay? So they want to have smooth and seamless operations. Why is it important to have that? So to minimize cost, when you increase bureaucracy, when there are more obstacles in your business operations, day to day as well as annual or quarterly or long term, it affects you in cost. There you can actually put a rupee value or a dollar value to it and that goes on your income statement and then the balance sheet. Okay, so to minimize that, you have to maximize the efficiency of operations to minimize the cost, which means you have to make the operation smooth, seamless and maybe even automated nowadays. Okay, and then of course, all of this results in overall employee satisfaction and you won't know this until you actually work somewhere or you know, you set up a business where how minor things can irk employees to the point where suddenly the efficiency and the productivity and the output goes down. It's a day wasted. We, when I was in DuPont, we used to have some quality issues on a line. And once the quality issue occurred, the line used to stop for two hours sometimes or even three hours. And the value, we calculated that actually, the value was $450 per hour. So $1,000 lost in two to three hours. And the order size was worth sometimes only $2,500. So we were actually making loss on that order when we had a quality issue. And when I joined, I did this calculation. Basically, if we had included that quality cost, the plant was going in losses. Okay, so that's why it is important to have smooth and seamless operations. Okay, and then of course, employee satisfaction. So you know, in, why have a business model? In order to run the business properly. Now, at the customer's end, at the customer perspective, they don't care what you are doing inside. What the customer wants is a good high quality product. They want instant delivery. 
they want good after delivery service if especially if the if something goes wrong and they want to make sure that they get at the best possible price and all of this dictates here and your business model concept has to account for all of these things okay so for a customer your business model should highlight the value proposition how you are going to capture the value and how you are going to deliver the value and this is also applicable to yourself as a startup owner and an entrepreneur as long as you are focused on how do you capture value how do you deliver value and what is the key value proposition you will automatically start working out on other aspects that drive your value proposition so my take on that is initially who should define that rather than what i'll ask you a question rhetorical question who should define what is most pr highest priority market or customer in fact i am having this team with a healthcare team right now i am having this issue with a healthcare team i told them do this they came back and said okay should we do this because you are saying i said no you should do this because the customer is asking for it their customer who happens to be a doctor is asking for that internal business functions will always they are a dynamic thing it's not a static thing they certainly change month to month even week to week sometimes even day to day basis so that you have to keep optimizing and you will do it when you are in full fledged operations where you will be able to see what the order book is what lies in front of you for a week or for a month and you will plan your activities for the next week or next month to keep it running at the most efficient manner at the least possible cost so the customers don't really bother about your internal activities that is your part but it's a dynamic process it's like working in a restaurant you have customers let's say suddenly they come around lunch time they are not going to order the same thing one day someone will come he will say i want this dish dish number 1 second day some other person will come he will want dish number 2 3 4 5 5 so it's very difficult to predict so that that's where you start scaling up you develop internal processes so you develop secret recipes that are you know three four recipes that can help you make 20 dishes for example okay so those are your internal things that you do so there are strategies to do th do all these things later point is that you that comes little later but initially your focus should be customer what the customer wants you have to do what whatever it takes okay so whether should the product be of most technologically advanced no if the customer doesn't want it you don't want to have it over advanced and add to the cost to the customer or impact your margins internally you keep it basic sell it make your first round of money then do product 2.0 with better features okay so whatever the customer wants that's what you have to deliver initially now there is this thing called i think we had uh, we asked one question right porter's forces michael porter's forces in the mid sem so what mr porter does is you as a startup are let's say you are here okay in the center of this thing you have to face multiple things okay one is the threat of new entrants and this is especially applicable to hard products okay increasingly soft products do the job of hard products so threat of new entrants will mean suddenly something comes along and it replaces you entirely okay second is threat of substitute products or services okay so some obvious examples are in fmcg industry you know new same thing new soaps new oils new this thing new that thing comes up even in pharmaceutical industries new medicines keep coming up and that can be a potential substitute product which will affect your market software same thing you know i mean uh, soft product same thing new apps facebook or code this that <laughs> they keep doing the same thing sorry i don't mean to laugh but they keep doing the same thing but if you don't find a way to survive it becomes difficult in the future the other thing you should worry about is bargaining power of suppliers so raw materials your product is going to use certain amount of raw materials right our products in healthcare will use very specific raw materials these are commodities that are exchanged at a global level in fact the awareness in india is very low of all these things unfortunately but they affect you and me on a daily basis even as a ordinary customer it affects us certainly as someone in the business it will affect largely all the pricing of raw materials okay and then of course bargaining power of customers which is determined by their income their position in the society their preferences we studied customer persona in our customer discovery slides right so all of this affects 
your idea, your business, your industry, your position in the industry. So what is required to constantly stay on top of things are is what I have listed here. Cutting edge products, obviously, as novel, as technologically advanced as possible. Okay. Second is speed to market. How quickly can you get to market? And this window is very thin. Okay. Mr. Steve Jobs once said, I have been hearing Bill Gates talk of a screen that people can hold and do this and do that, but I have not seen the screen. And then in less than one year, he launched the iPad, that speed to market. Of course, he let that news out just before he launched the iPad. But the point I am trying to make is that it is a highly competitive environment and you have one to two years, quite frankly, in the real world to launch your product or else it is gone. Okay. Two years ago, I was hearing blockchain, 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 blockchain. Blockchain resulted in some B2B businesses. Literally, two weeks ago, I was talking to someone. He said, blockchain abhi chala gaya. It's old now. That's the lifespan of some ideas nowadays. Okay. Third is, of course, workforce advantage, which means you have to have the best and the brightest to do the jobs that you want them to do. Okay. There is this other class I am doing where they are coming up with ideas like vertical farming. I mean, it's been done to death. Okay. Someone came up with an idea of a software app for retail shops. It's already there, something called Khata Book. Khata Book or some, it's, it's actually a, from IIT, I think. So the point is, there also things matter, even in startup domain. Unless you have a completely novel breakthrough idea, Chances are someone is already, in fact, when I was working earlier as a scientist, I used to say, if I can think of it, someone else has already thought of it. And it's actually true. If you study the development, some of the technological developments as a race between US and Russia, what you will find is that when they were applying for patents, almost simultaneously Russian scientists were applying for some of the same patents that US scientists were applying. Because it's a logical progression. So if you can think of it, someone else can think of it and lot of times they may quickly do it. No, I mean that's like giving up. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you increase your speed. <laughs> you should not build on somebody else's thing. As an entrepreneur, you should build on your own entrepreneurial idea as much as possible. If you are building on somebody else's thing, you better be very fast. So there is invention and innovation, right? Ideally, you want invention, you have patented it, you have a edge over others. Innovation is incremental changes that will help you get further just by a little bit. Some features we add to cell phones that we get, so that's innovation, that's not invention. But a buttonless cell phone is more of an invention over a button based cell phone. Okay? So the more technological edge you have, the better off you are. Fair enough? And then of course, you know, you have to worry about technological environment, that's partly speed to market. But the other thing is, you don't want to be too far ahead, products have failed because they were so far ahead of the curve, people didn't understand them technologically. They didn't find it useful enough and they have failed, especially soft products. Okay. Social environment in terms of acceptability for your product. And what I mean by global environment is global business environment as well as all kinds of catastrophes that happen, right? Suddenly something like 9-11 happens or major hurricanes happen, global warming happens. That also can determine how you position yourself and your product in the market. Okay? So business model should capture as much as possible all of these things. Now in any business model, your primary activities are as listed here. Okay? Inbound logistics, so raw material that comes in, this may not be applicable to AIML. Operations, internal operations to make the product. AIML also this is ap applicable. You make an app or whatever product, you release it, then you have to maintain it. So operations you know, it should capture the maintenance part. Outbound logistics, how you deliver the product to the customer, including delivery and service for AIML, and then sales and marketing. Okay. And in fact, Professor Raj will give the last lecture. He may say, he came up with a product. He Initially, they were selling it for $1,000, and they found one sales and marketing guy who sold the same product for $10,000. Same product for $10,000 relatively simpler software product. So sales and marketing are a major, you know, uh, aspect of your business and then servicing of course. And they essentially contribute to your primary costs. Okay. And all of these activities are supporting activities, administrative, finance, HR, 
R&D procurement that is all supporting activity in the business world. But they add to your cost okay? and some of them can be quite expensive like R&D tends to be expensive, marketing tends to be the biggest cost actually for most companies. Okay? And all of this results in cost, so value added less cost is your profit. Everyone understands cost price profit, profit margin, the differences, the nuances, all this is clear. I don't have to explain that to you, right? So as you go along, like I said earlier, you are in a dynamic state on almost on a day, certainly on a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis. So you keep refining your value equation. You reduce factors that should be reduced so that you improve your efficiency. You eliminate cert certain factors that are not necessary. This also comes into play when you have to determine what should be kept in versus what should be outsourced. Okay? And there are various ways of calculating that, the value, the cost, etc., the ease of operations, the ease of delivery, the uh, proximity to the customer, all those factors come in. And then you raise certain factors okay, so that you position yourself in the best possible manner. You deliver the best possible product. You become a brand. Okay? Tata's entered automobile companies, I mean, into automobiles much later. Globally, though, they entered much later. Even within India, Maruti had a fair capturing of the market. It took them 10, 12 years starting from Indica to, you know, Tiago to really start establishing themselves in the market. But with Nexon, they have really raised the standards, the quality, everything. And EV gave them that even bigger niche or bigger technological advantage that helped them push forward. Okay. So, they created some new factors when they entered the EV industry. So, Tesla and you are lucky to be in India <laughs> to, because you can go buy a Tata if you can, I mean EV, a Tata EV if you can afford one. Only mostly only US people buy a Tesla. I am talking of average model 3. I am not talking of the bigger better cars that only the rich can afford. I am talking of an average person cost. Okay. Not many countries have EVs for example, right. So, you are very lucky to be in this country. These are all the components that should be captured in your business model. Okay? I keep harping on the same thing, value proposition, margins, operational efficiency, revenue channels. So, these are the top three you should do in for immediate results. Okay? But these are the bottom three are the ones for long term sustenance, efficiency, market positioning and then long term outlook. And it is a constant exercise. It should be running at the back of your mind all the time. Various types of business models and we have some of them in our class B2B, B2C, B2G, B2B2C, B2G2C, b 2 b 2 c b 2 you know everything essentially. Your customer is your paying customer but the paying customer may be influenced by his or her customer. Another class they are trying to do something he came to me his paying customer is the government but the government's choice to pay is, is dependent on the regular people that drive. So, if he can provide data of the regular people to the government, he can convince the government to pay him. So, that becomes like a B 2 G 2 C kind of a model. You probably know the idea. So, the point is irrespective of that, okay, you have to have a fair model. Manufacturer model where you are able to dictate terms, Nexon EV is one of the examples for that. Retailer franchise, I do not have to tell you, DMART, other franchises are an option. Then of course, Pay as you go, SaaS, PaaS, product as a service, software as a service, freemium, subscription and marketplace bundling. Okay? So, depending on your product, you have to figure out the best possible business model and sometimes your business model can change over time or you may have different models for different customers, I mean different customer segments and we will see what is customer segment, but you will have different models for different customer segments. Okay? Increasingly, that will be the case. You will have to customize, you will have to personalize your products as well as your business model as you go along. So, this is what I call a monthly or even a weekly report card, the business model canvas for every startup. So, now is when you should start using your pen and pencil and paper. Okay? So, business model canvas looks like this. It has 9 boxes. Okay? And you have to fill out those boxes for your own good as a team. Okay? And I always say you should have two copies. One in which you list the top three or four items in each of those boxes and one in which you fill out everything in all of those boxes. So, for example, customer segment. If you have two or top two or three customer segments, you should fill that out. Okay? 
But then if you have 10 segments, you should have another business model canvas where you fill out all 10. So that full, full fledged, full blown is for your study and your use. The shorter one is to highlight the most important things and to show it to the investor. There is actually a statistical calculation that shows that if you address top 20% of the problems, you increase your efficiency by 80%. It's called the 80-20 rule. So that top 20% is for the investor and one copy of your business model canvas. The other one, the longer one is for your own study. So how do you fill it out, right? I mean, normally most people go left to right. If you're writing Urdu, you go right to left. But this is slightly different. You start with your value propositions in the center, okay? And you list those value propositions. Then you go to the right. You first fill out the rightmost box by defining your customer segments. Everyone understands customer segments, right? We had covered this. If there are questions, please feel free to ask. Then the channels to get to them. This may be delivery of your product. This may be reaching them over a telephone call. This may be reaching over uh, internet advertising. Okay, you must be getting some calls. I get a lot of spam calls. Bajaj Finance wants to finance me for some reason. I don't know why. Product delivery also is covered in this. Okay, I get calls. God knows how many phone numbers they generate, but I get a call from a new number every day from Bajaj Finance. Okay, so that's the way to reach customers. Then of course, how will you establish relationships, initial as well as long term? Okay, then you fill out your key activities. Okay, so that is like box number five. So one, two, three, four and five. What are the key activities that you will perform? And this can also help you determine what should be kept in versus what should be outsourced. Okay. The key resources required. So for you, for example, raw material resources, other resources, even copper wiring resources. Okay. And then key partners. And this can be your government official also in that key partners. Okay. That can provide you these things. And then of course you fill out what is the cost structure. Most people do not put numbers here, although I advise that, that you should put a, try to estimate what is the cost and put a number there. It is always impressive to the investor when you do that. And then what are your re revenue streams? How will you generate revenues? Okay. So here is another picture I found interesting because you start with value proposition. And as these arrows direct you, you know, think of customer segments, think how you, you will get to them, how you will build the relationships. And then to support this, you have these key activities and the resource box, but to support that you have key partners and then these two boxes are different, okay. So here typically it means partners that provide you with the resources for the most part, but stakeholder also can be a key part, mostly physical in this case. Yeah, your business model canvas can change. That is usually what happens. You get cheaper and you go to company B. You float a tender. Typically in the market, you float a tender. You invite bids to supply that raw material. You have a round of negotiations and then you, uh, then you negotiate the least possible price and you sign a contract for one year, two years, sometimes even longer. You will provide me this raw material for a period of these many months at this fixed price or at this fixed price plus minus 10 percent, 20 percent, whatever that margin. And look, nobody is putting a gun to your head and asking you to reveal everything. You decide what you want to put, want to put in those boxes, okay. <laughs> but my first sentence when I started on this business model canvas was, this is your report card, report card for yours, okay. And that is why I said you should have two copies, one true copy for yourself, list everything that you want to list and one copy for the investor, show what you want to show. Okay. So value propositions, what are the value propositions? What do they mean typically? They have to highlight what problems they will solve for the customer. They will, what needs and desires they satisfy and having and have a lasting impact. So how will you go over and above to satisfy the customer? So typically if, if you want the customer to pay you 100 rupees, what value do you have to provide? If I want you to pay me 100 rupees, the feeling you should get when I am selling a product is you are getting worth something or at least 150 or 200, right, if not more than that. So that is how you have to highlight value for all of you, okay. I, it can be quantitative or qualitative. I personally like it if it's quantitative, you know, otherwise it can raise questions. And what are some of the ways you can highlight that? Cost reduction is the obvious thing, how you can provide the same thing for less cost, but risk reduction. 
so lot of these things are at our at our unconscious level we are aware of these things but consciously we are not aware so customers are not aware so you can convince the customer by telling him or her how you will reduce the risk insurance companies typically do this okay effort reduction time savings or time reduction to do the work okay ease of execution how someone can email you can execute communication much more easily whatsapp you can send files much more easily than email okay although it's as a customer it may be difficult for me to track but the point is all of these things are a part of value enhanced experience especially for ai ml you know it gives me an enhanced let's say someone is doing smart glasses or augmented reality how it can give me enhanced experience okay ready accessibility and convenience and then of course novelty customization these are increasingly becoming more Im important customization personalization how it will help them get the job done now customer groups broadly people talk in terms of individual customers and business customers still people don't talk in terms of government as a customer although in reality it can be your customer okay and then of course you have to list which specific types forms locations and then individuals we did this thing on customer segments the obvious things are the physical aspects of customers the geographical locations the next obvious thing is educational attainment uh, income levels family backgrounds you know certain skill sets but even more is psychological and ethnographic is what it's called so you know what's how the customer thinks what are his or her preferences if someone works in a corporate environment he will probably dress like this if someone works in a non corporate environment it will be relatively relaxed so based on that i can decide which shirt to sell him or her whatever the situation is so all of these things you have to study okay uh, in terms of customers and you really should study we have had last year there was a team that was doing a drowning prevention device and initially when we told them about customer discovery they didn't bother but finally they went to the customer closer to final presentations suddenly they discovered new things that guy calls me and tells me th sir thank you i did customer discovery i realized i should have done it sooner okay and then they presented their customer discovery and product so the sooner you do this and complete this the better off you are in terms of making your product okay so although it may seem sort of kind of obvious kind of uh, tds it's not trivial it's important for all of you to do that okay what are the type of markets obviously mass mar sorry mass market you already know niche market healthcare typically you have niche markets for your ideas okay you also have a niche market in some ways for example aiml may have a lot of niche markets for your products okay then of course this this is mostly jargon segmented market diversified market etc so i wouldn't wor worry too much as long as you are focused on the customer it's okay so i don't know if i have given you this slide but this is an important slide although a textual slide pillars of segmentation so the demographic aspect which is obvious age gender education income it's tangible you and i know geographic again obvious tangible city urban rural country local culture climate you know all these things but the psychographic and the behavioral are are the hidden aspects of customers that you have to really find out okay so there was uh, one guy was in my office earlier today and he is trying to make a product to automate this signaling process or something like that and i was trying to tell him look the customer may not be convinced with the benefits that you are offering because the benefits are so minuscule it may not be worth his time and money to invest in his idea okay so it may seem very obvious to us initially but unless you do customer discovery you will not find out so now he is actually going to go and do the customer discovery see b2b in fact is even more specific in this okay they will say ki this is what we want can you provide it at this cost first is you should know your customer there who is the real customer and what he or she wants generally b2b they they are very specific in terms of what they want and the price that they want it see even b2b if you can determine the psychographic makeup of the ceo i leave that thought there itself b2g it's even more important they may do a lot of effort in trying to sell their product but unless they are willing to do little bit under the table sorry i should not mention this in academic environment but we all know that's true right 
unfortunately or fortunately whatever but the point is psychographic makeup is applicable to everything okay in fact that sometimes that thing drives more than sensible decision making trust me so customer relationships you know for each customer segment you may have a separate way of doing it you may have to have a separate relationship with each of those segments and what are the motivations obviously what i have listed acquisition and retention so in marketing you will come across terms like cost cost of customer acquisition and cost of, cost per contact and things like that so so cost of acquisition is an important concept you should know how much do you end up paying to really get the customer to pay you finally the first time that is your cost of acquisition and then there is a lifetime value which means how much the customer will pay you over the lifetime for which he or she buys the product from you okay and so if you can determine this early you can decide how much should be should your cost of acquisition be it's called cac cac okay so that's that customer satisfaction but then also boosting sales by upselling now that is a little bit of an ethical line you decide how far you want to go but it's okay marketing you know it's it's acceptable to upsell a product okay and then of course for customer relationships i have been saying this customized or personal services personal assistance what is the difference between a five star and a seven star the only difference as far as i know is that five uh, seven star has a dedicated concierge to every room while five star will have you know one concierge for more than one room okay that's the only difference but that's dedicated personal assistance but that is considered important in the hoteling industry now for your businesses you have to decide what should be your paths forward so channels include ways of communication as well as actual delivery of the product so value propositions and you can have your own channels or partner channels and direct or indirect channels okay some examples i have listed them here but for channels typically you know you have a customer goes through these five phases first he or she is not even aware so you have to create the awareness then he or she will evaluate i mean it's common sense right you someone comes to sell you something you first ask what it is then you evaluate do you need it do you want it will it add value to your own lifestyle okay then finally he or she will at some point hopefully pay you and make the purchase but that's where his role ends or her role ends but not your role you have to deliver the product and provide after sales service okay and this can include just a courtesy call to see if he or she is happy key activities i lot of people you know they list physical activities only i think you should list financial as well as intellectual activities and then for the types i have listed them here manufacturing sales services procurement delivery problem solving for service companies aiml can be more of a service company than a product company so there you know how will you pro solve a problem can be a key activity and then for platforms and networks you know match making platforms software brands how will you deliver value okay and like i have been saying it based on that you can decide what you want to keep internal or outsource okay key resources again i have been saying this material mechanical financial intellectual your hr your human resources are also important resources intellectual so normally for tax benefits people start off as a llp okay and then as you grow you can either become a private limited company or a public limited company so ankit mehta eventually went the public limited route when he floated the stocks okay but you can choose to remain private limited but the taxes will be higher in that particular case and usually that determines your decision whether you should do a llp or a private limited investors wouldn't care that much especially initially as long as you are selling your product if you are making sales and even if you are not making profits investors will invest the best example is zomato right for number of years i think they recently broke it. they recently developed a model to break into profit they were making losses all these years another example is ola i don't think ola is also has figured out exactly how to maximize their profits ola or uber whatever meaning these taxi services right now but if they are making sales they are generating activities they are delivering some value to the customer which is why investors are investing so as far as investors is concerned as long as you are on top of things and generating sales you, you will get money especially when your idea is novel that's what matters 
if it's not a tried and tested idea, if it's a relatively novel idea, that is what matters. The point is, see, when Zomato came out, it was very novel. So when Swiggy or others come out, they have to provide some novel aspect to get investment. That is one thing. It can be faster delivery. It can be lower pricing, yet better margins by reducing the cost further. Okay. So they will have to provide some kind of novelty for the investors to be wanting to invest further. Some advantage over already existing business. See, I'll give you an example. Okay, between Amazon and Swiggy or Flipkart and Swiggy. Okay, so Flipkart or Amazon may have uh, go-downs, right? Where they may store some things and then deliver to the customer. Swiggy may say, "We will not do this. We may just deliver from the origin to the customer." That, so that's the novelty aspect. And so there, what they showed to the investor at that time is that look, tier 2, tier 3 cities are unaddressed by Amazon and whatever the other companies, Flipkart. So here's my market opportunity. That is how they get investment. I mean, look, in the US, it's very difficult to operate like this, okay? Because in US, quickly what happens is one company comes, quickly captures the market. And even if others jump in, they may not make as much money. And finally, the survivors are two or three max. Best example is automotive companies. Okay, automotive companies are 100 year old industry. So many automotive companies have been formed, especially in the US. And which are the biggest? Traditionally, which have been the biggest? General Motors, Ford, and then Chrysler to some extent. Even when they were re replaced by Japanese cars, Japanese companies, again, Toyota, Honda, Volkswagen is German. But Toyota, Honda, and that's about it. Nissan and Subaru, you know, they couldn't really get into the market. Volkswagen is not big in US. That's why they probably came to India, okay, as far as I know. In fact, the Volkswagen is a slightly different story, actually. Volkswagen was popular in Europe. It first became popular in Europe. They came up with this model called Beetle which became very popular, especially amongst the ladies, they were able to break into the British market and the Spanish markets. And quite soon after World War II, meaning they were afraid, you know, these people will not accept our products, but they were able to break into those things. But US, I haven't seen that many Volkswagen. And you can look up numbers, you know, for US sales for that matter. The Japanese were able to capture the US market, yes. First is we don't have the balance sheet to comment on that, okay. But what you said is right, it may be their marketing strategy, it may be their high pay to their executives. So some of the banks in US closed down, right, large well established banks in US closed down. Your executives were making a lot of money, they were having high salaries. But was it proportionate to the profits or their operations? No. Okay. So internally what happens, it's difficult for me to comment on that. Okay. But these are some, marketing is usually a huge expense for any company, especially when they are growing. Uh, lately, all these executive compensation has come into picture, how much each one of them picks up. Uh, third can be R&D. Uh, Ola and Uber, they may be paying something to Google Maps or whatever. We don't know that expense. Okay. Uh, EVs will require huge R&D or huge investment Okay, if they want to go all EV. Okay. And so based on that, they decide what is credit and what is debit. Okay. At an individual level, let's say you buy a SIP or a mutual fund. Is it credit or debit? You're investing. Generally, you invest. You don't spend on a SIP or a mutual fund. You invest in a mutual fund or a SIP. So at an individual level, I'm talking. Okay. So is that going to benefit you or no? It, long term, you do it because it, you feel that you will get benefited. So it should be more, it seems more like a credit activity. But in your balance sheet or tax forms, you fill it out as a debit or an expense activity. So Ola, all companies do this to save on taxes in particular. And as long as the model is new, as long as there is no competition, as long as the investors are putting in money, they will do that. Only when investors object strongly, only when there is a lot of competition, only when the model has become far too jaded, will they say, Ki, now let me, you know, either go public or start showing good balance sheet so that when I go public, I get high valuation. Key partnerships, obviously, you will establish key partnerships with, uh, you know, your providers as well as customers. But the important thing to understand in developing partnerships are the short term contracts and long term contracts. Okay. What is important is what is written in the contract. And there is, there are sayings like you should read between the lines, 
you should read the fine print and you realize that only when you sign a contract and something goes wrong against you. <laughs> okay. So, everyone knows this. Now, in a legal school, they have an entire subject called contracts. That is how important contracts are and you will sign a contract only after consulting a lawyer typically, personal or business, especially business more than personal because there are always some tricky things that you know they will extract money out of you rather than help you in a difficult situation in any contract. Okay. So, it sounds very obvious, it sounds like two, three words short term, long term contracts, but they are important things. One guy was in my office today and he was saying, he, he comes from a very well off background. Should I establish my business close to the Navasheva airport, which is in New Bombay area or the Mundra airport, which is in Gujarat area. Okay. And I said it depends, right? Because in the state of Maharashtra, the longest term contract for land you can sign is 30 years. There, there used to be a time when you could sign a 99 year lease that is now gone away as far as I know. BMC I know for sure it is 30 years max. You cannot sign anything more than 30 years. So, when you establish a business, a long term business for that produces hard products that like this guy wants to do, you look for a 30 year cycle, 50 year cycle, maybe even a 100 year cycle. Okay. So, in, if in the state of Maharashtra he can sign only a 30 year contract, let us say at 1 crore per annum, he has to pay 1 crore per annum, he gets a certain piece of land, 30 year signed versus Mundra airport where he signs a cheaper contract 50 lakhs per annum for the same space for the same piece of land same size of land for 100 years or 99 years which is the preferred contract that is one way of looking at it great way of looking at it. the other is obvious after 30 years suddenly they may demand 5 crores per annum or 10 crores per annum instead of 1 crore per annum so you are reducing your risk by signing a longer term contract for a fixed price and like he said the depreciation factor will come in for 100 years versus 30 years. So, even if you keep the business constant, actually there is no clear answer here, Okay, A or B you cannot, you cannot, there is no good or bad or right or wrong here. It really depends on multiple scenarios. So, this is part of those multiple scenarios, but for just this part the bare minimum risk reduction or thinking that should go in deciding which contract to sign is what I what he just said and what I just said. Depreciation as well as long term benefits and what will be cheaper over time. Okay. So, that is what you have to keep in mind when you sign contracts besides the obvious finer nuances and the language used okay, in short and long term contracts. And in all of this like he, uh, Naman partly said optimization and economy of scale. So, you can innovate, you can grow big. So, 99 years will give you a longer period of time, but it should not result in laxity by any means okay, versus 30 years. Okay, you, you will not be made to move out after 30 years. Okay. Risk of reduction and uncertainty when you sign a longer contract and then acquisition of particular resources and activities. So, this is essentially what we were talking instead of developing a plant or manufacturing unit in land, he wanted to be closer to the port because acquisition of particular resources and activities were important for him. Okay. So, all of these things you have to factor in. Now, generally AIML some of these things may not even be applicable. Okay. It is very uh, what is the word for that? It is uh, geography agnostic, let me put it that way. <laughs> internet is a different beast, right? It is a location agnostic thing, a, a internet based product. But even companies like Amazon and all, they worry about, you know, things like distance from customer, what will be the cost of delivery and so on and so forth. But all these other products, these things play a bigger role, okay? So, cost structure, in accounting terms, the terms used are fixed cost and variable costs. Okay. And in my finance lecture, I am trying to cover what are fixed costs, variable costs, how do you determine unit cost, unit economics is the term used, unit cost, unit price, how do you scale up, how do you determine how to scale up, what are the financial considerations, we will do that after the DIY sessions. But fixed costs are typically land, machinery, variable costs are raw material, labor. Okay. Typically cost includes, you know, these kind of things, real estate or land, material, mechanical or machine energy okay that also can be a various a variable cost and labor 
these are the main costs in making a product ok. But these are all other cost operational and administrative marketing and services and as you grow your business your other auxiliary costs cost you more than the basic costs that are required to make a product. That is why engineers now have to do MBA because they pay, pay better as a marketing person than an engineer ok. Trust me that is how the market and industry has gone ok. So, that, but you have to account for all, all of these things and you have to worry about economies of scale and scope. So, for my, the finance lecture I have an ex, excel based exercise that I will show you ok. There I think you will get a fair idea not a perfect idea but a fair complete idea of how costs play a role over there ok. But that is important because you know in business this is what matters and then revenue streams profit and loss direct and allied revenues even AIML you may have some other forms of revenues right advertising on the website or whatever this will give you revenues. And then two thing two concepts transaction revenues recurring revenues transaction is one time payment for you it will most likely be transaction revenues recurring is continuous payment some of you have those kind of ideas over there ok. Asset sale I mean ways to generate revenue streams so if you are going in la losses sell your assets that is one, one way of doing it or you say subscription fees all of these things I presume you know these things right. Pricing mechanism is slightly different we will talk about it in finance lecture and there are teams that determine pricing strategies and pricing mechanisms in large companies ok. So, things like cost plus profit things like variable pricing things like what the customer is able to pay all of these things come into picture in uh, pricing ok. So, fixed versus dynamic pricing is what it comes to. So, this is a recap of all the slides we have seen. I hope you took some notes. I was hoping that you would list some of the things for your startups and ideas as I spoke along. I hope some of you at least tried that ok. What we can do now is, so one of the things is you know you, this is actually pretty basic you do not write on a canvas you can do this as a team you know use post its instead of write it. Do not act weird you know work as a team do not be bossy do not act as if you know everything it should be a team effort be concise think in the present you know initially quantity over quality. So, do not worry when you are doing this brainstorming idea generation thing do not worry about quality just keep writing 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 writing. We do this brainstorming session in Betic where we think of a name for the startup there is no right or wrong good or bad name you just keep coming up with names and you write for one hour one hour as a team ok. And then you start you know prioritizing quality prioritizing certain features or whatever and that is how they come up with names like IU devices or IU something or things like that. So, initially quantity over quality no self censoring and then for double sided meaning if you have two markets supplier versus customer you can use different post it things. So, what we can do is we can do a quick exercise here ok which is a common exercise. I could have picked one example, but that would have meant ki I am solving the B BMC for that team which I did not want to do. So, I thought let us do cab E or blue smart I have seen these EVs EV equivalent of Uber uh, on the roads, but I have seen very few of them very very few of them I do not even know how to book one I tried once I failed ok. So, I thought how about doing a BMC for that as a team as a class. So, Ola and Uber is already well established in Bombay. So, let us focus on Bombay ok. They already have good business going on good revenue generation profit loss I do not know, but they are generating revenue. So, let us say we want to fill this out how will we do it do this. So, what is the value proposition when already the diesel based things are existent diesel or petrol based or CNG based what is the value proposition for an electric vehicle as part of Uber or completely going electric. So, you are saying cheaper service positive image, but customer does the customer really care about the image there is a group that cares is it large enough. So, ok so it matters is what you are saying ok got it. So, low operation cost ok they are right value proposition to the customer. So, we will take this out low operation cost accessibility is already there by Ola and Uber. So, probably filling the gap in the market in peak hours more than accessibility, but they are not doing it right now. So, let us say literally Uber we are let us say we are doing this literally for Uber and Uber already has diesel cars or whatever CNG cars in the market, but I know for a fact that they, these people do not turn up for sometimes 20 minutes in office times ok. 
and they have the gall to deny business ki i will not come <laughs> so i look for new drivers and when i am looking for newer drivers maybe i insist that you should have an electric vehicle it's the name of a company that does electric cars similar to ola so the value proposition is 100% guarantee yeah. that the cab will be provided that is the value proposition yeah. okay so i'll just put 100% guarantee here even for blue smart yeah. But that, but that's what they are saying about Uber. So reduction of ambiguity. I'll add that in the brackets. Okay. So for the time being, I'll take that newer cars. So who are the customer segments? So working professionals with fixed schedule. Let me put it that way. Okay. Okay. Young working professionals. Okay. Who else? Let me say environmentally conscious customer. Uh, that we can add here. Okay. So. ESG conscious customer, maybe school children delivery from school to home, something like that. I don't know. Then what are the, who are the key partners or do you want to fill out everything? Customer channels, how will you go there? How will you reach them? App and digital advertising, digital adverts and social media. That's digital. Okay. Workplace based collaboration. Yes. Workplace based adverts. Okay. How will you develop the relationships oh, with customers? Better service, better service and cab drivers, better and more affable cab drivers. I used to sit in the front. Now I make it a point to sit in the back. Let's say I'm a part of, I own this company and someone who chooses tobacco comes to me. I may say no, he may not fit in with that affable and better cab drivers. Okay. Promo codes, maybe 11th service free or after 10 services, something like that. Yeah promo codes but let's try to what are the key activities obviously serving the yeah. customer so fastest delivery or instant delivery fair enough and then maintaining fleet maintenance actually fleet maintenance is easy anything else if they are leasing the cars to you know making sure that the drivers are happy they don't steal all those things that also becomes a part of their activities okay Managing the drivers, let's just put it that way, okay? Because every time you have employees, there is a chance of strike, right? So that's just bad ethics and bad practice. So they make, they earn interest on, on that money. Yeah, they in, earn interest on in that money. But that's bad ethics and bad practice. Key resources, who are the key? Cars and more, even keyer resources. Uh, drivers, drivers are the biggest resources. And anyone else? Charging stations, that's what I was hoping for here. Charging points, key partnerships, key partnership is again drivers, charging companies or points, points owners, whatever. Okay. So then leasing companies, usually not. So that, that is on the right side of the whole thing. Key partnerships are people who provide the resources typically. Okay. Cost structure, uh, car purchase, so car cost, driver salary, charging, market, marketing comes later, but TK, I'll add it. Land to store cars, parking spots or whatever, parking costs, okay, those are your costs, okay. And if you can put a number here, that's most welcome and exp sort of impressive. Okay, so overall employees, yes, so driver salary, I'm trying to say ki all, all employees, okay. I'll, I'll just put additional cost here, okay. Revenue streams, okay, customer payments, uh, adverts by other companies. Green credits, yeah, that's a good idea. In terms of this, especially this business model canvas, I tried to I tried to fill it up myself. So this is what I could come up with. Okay. If you want, you can do I have an idea app to monitor personal expenses. You can use it to sort of get a feel for and practice for how to fill out DMC. Okay, but do it for your own ideas and own teams. Okay. And in general, as long as you are creating economic value, social value. Increasingly, that is becoming important and you do continuous innovation, you will have long-term sustainability, okay? Be a capitalist, nothing wrong, but do good things in being a capitalist, okay? Don't do bad things in doing that, okay? Thank you everyone for your kind attention.